two videos. You've returned. You've returned to YouTube. Six month break, two videos, three weeks apart. <laughs> you're right over there. You doing okay? I was gonna say, was I ever away from YouTube? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Does yeah. does six months count as away? Uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe it does. Let's see if your Wikipedia page is if they've moved it around again. Oh no! Don't give that. Don't yeah. give those people. No, no, the you're, you're back. You're back. <laughs> Educational YouTuber and podcaster. They switched oh. it back around. <laughs> As everybody knows now, they know you're back to YouTube. I was very surprised by this. Uh-huh. I was surprised to see one pop up and then like another one, like three weeks later. You're, you're on a tear again. Is it now going to be like well, four no, no, years like, until the next one? one? Like, don't set up an expectation like <laughs> on a tear. Right? Uh-huh. You're not doing me. You're not doing me any favors right. with something like that, Mike. Look, it's, it is as it always ever was. Videos. When do they come out? They come out when they come out. They're not late. They're not early. They arrive on their publication date. So there happen to be two. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like, don't use phrases like on a tear. Mm -hmm. It just just is what it is. Well, I'm just going to say, you're doing a lot to set them up. You're like story for another time. You keep saying it, you know, like, I'm just going to say you're you're putting it out there for people. (laughs) You know, you're only you're only making your own bed here. No, I, I, disagree, I disagree. Look, I just I couldn't talk about the Indian reservations in the second one, and so I'm just I wanted to acknowledge that and then move right along. That's what story for another time is. Yep. Uh, you know, you just sometimes you have to reference a thing that people are going to ask about, and that maybe you think you're going to make a video about, but then when the video actually gets published, you're so exhausted with the topic that you you never get around to it. Maybe that's what happens sometimes with a story for another time. It's like a it's like a release. <laughs> it's like a release valve. <laughs> it's a release valve. Don't look yeah. over here. Look over there. Yeah, or it's like a get out of one video free card that you can play on the table with story YouTube for YouTube a time. monopoly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's got to exist, right? That must exist. Did you see they have a millennials monopoly now where like you never own any property? This is real. They make it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's real. That's t- oh, that's terrible. That's yeah. really terrible. It's good, right? Like That makes me so sad for your people. It's so bad. It's almost like I can't believe they made it, but it's true. Like the, It's a real thing. There's no, there's no owning property and... It, the actual tagline on the box it almost seems like this is a joke but you can buy it it says forget real estate you can't afford it anyway that is the, the tagline on the box for millennial monopoly oh god it's so sad it's crazy right i'm trying to find the bo- so like what happens when you what happens when you land on park place i don't understand you just you just pay money all the time is that how that works you're paying rent Right. And it's a quicker game. So you what? You start with like $1,000 and whoever runs out of I guess rent so. first is the first loser. They've, does like the, they've got exa- I'm looking at a Guardian article about it. They have community chess cards. Like your free web streaming trial expires. Pay the bank $40. <laughs> and the, the, instead of like, and it has like emoji icons and hashtags and stuff as the pieces instead of like top hats and whatever. Oh, it's so sad. It is terrible. Really. Oh, okay, oh, but like, I mean, some of this makes me angry, right? Because like, one of these things is a uh, week-long meditation retreat, yeah. pay fifty dollars. It's like, yeah. but I was thinking of doing something like that. That sounds like fun. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous, really. I mean, I I feel like I'm not sure if they're doing it to troll everyone or not. Like, I can't work it out. Like, so the 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 on the board, right? You've got parents' basement, friends' wait, couch. Wait a minute, like. Hasbro has made this. Yeah, yeah, it's real. Oh you can God. buy it. I, yeah, no, like I, I was thinking it was a parody or something, but no, no. no. So... it looks like it though. But no, this is a legit, complete troll of people. This may be the saddest thing we've ever discussed on. It's the show. terrible, right? This may right? be the saddest thing we've ever discussed on the show. It's terrible. I can't believe they made it, really. And like, yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't get them. But anyway, so going back to your videos. <laughs> no, uh... I was gonna say. Right. So wait, how do we get off on this? Oh, right. YouTuber monopoly. Yeah. Surely that must exist. I I agree with you. Uh, I'm not quite sure how the mechanisms of that would work because you couldn't be scooping up YouTube channels, so you'd have to land on. I don't know. Now, each square is a different channel, and while you're there, you're collabing. Oh, perfect! Right, perfect. so you have okay. like the CGP like Grey Square, the MKBHD right. Square, the iJustine Square, and they're all worth different amounts. And it's right. not money, right? Like, it has their subscriber counts instead of money on the bottom. Right, and that also makes perfect sense because you could, like the properties, you could group YouTubers together. Do a mo- like a big collab thing. Yeah, 
right? Or or like people who are in similar fields, mm -hmm. they're the equivalent of a property. So then when you you, like you get the the collab of three edu tubers, mm -hmm. and it's like boom, now you can build hotels or whatever, whatever the equivalent is. I like it. Is that the phrase edu tuber? I've I've heard this phrase a lot recently. I I, I I've been traveling, and I just came back from what could be described as an edu tube conference. Mm -hmm. Uh, ThinkerCon down in Huntsville, Alabama, yep. run by my friend Destin. And uh, yeah, I heard the phrase edutuber a bunch. Look, language sometimes it's like, it's I like hate the waves collab. of the ocean. Like that, that makes my skin crawl, that, that word, collab. I don't. I have been hearing collab for so many years, oh, I'm sure I don't you, even well, register I'm sure it anymore. I'm sure you've heard it an awful lot during your edutube conference, right? I'm sure there were lots of people that wanted to collab with you during that period of time. Yeah, I, I, I like. I genuinely think I've forgotten that collab was ever an abbreviation. That right. I, I think in my mind, it's just the word now. So, like, do you start shortening it? Like, you're gonna do a lab? Like, you yeah. just start shortening that word? Yeah, so. that is what's that is what's going to happen. Yeah, you're gonna do a lab with someone. But it's really nice to see uh, your videos. Cause I like that. I have always enjoyed your videos, but I like seeing a return to the kind of more traditional format. Right, which has has been gone for a bit. You mean you didn't you didn't enjoy so much my path of of wandering through a garden of death? That, no, that but was, even the death less... vid videos, like these ones, are in the style of that, right? Like because you did your vlog, you did the dragon tyrant video, like they mm -hmm. were more departures from your typical style. And whilst I enjoyed those, it's nice to have the more kind of traditional video back with the kind of more recent added flair of the enhanced animation and stuff. So yeah, they were really great. I was pleased to uh, see you make your return. But I wondered if there was, I don't know, if there was anything different about those videos that you wanted to touch on at all, like in the production process or anything like that. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, as, as much as I, I may deny it i will also secretly acknowledge that yes i understand that these two videos are a return to form mm -hmm. uh and I, I don't mind after we could we could call it a break but after, you know after a little while of of not having videos up on the youtube channel uh i don't mind having having two in a row that i th i think are what people think of in their head as like quote traditional cgp gray videos yeah the Right, like though I will firmly maintain the channel is mine and I can do with it whatever I like. Of course. Nonetheless, I can acknowledge that in people's heads they have an idea of this is what a traditional video is like. Yep. But yeah, so uh, how how much how much behind the scenes should I say? All right, let's let's have some behind the scenes here. Uh, so one of the reasons why I particularly don't like you discussing about these videos as being on a tear mm -hmm. is because. <sighs> All right, I, I don't really have any control over what videos are made. Just, just uh, to be clear. <laughs> no, no, that's not. They don't grow, right? No, no, <laughs> look, no. But let me, let me, let me elaborate, right? You must have at least a little bit. But no, I, I, I genuinely don't think that I do. In, in this sense, like, I don't. I think I've written it somewhere, somewhere on the internet. It exists as like the tagline for my channel of like. I make videos that are interesting to me. Like this, this is the idea of the channel. Yeah. And humans cannot control what they are interested in. And so that's why, like, when I've done videos that are different, it's because, like, oh, I'm interested in life extension as a topic right now. And I find, like, I can't have it leave my brain. And then it's like, oh, and then this video appears. So mm -hmm. I mean it in, in that sense. Okay. Like, I've been in a lot of situations where, for example, say another edutuber wants to collab. Can we please stop? I'm sorry. Can we another please? edutuber wants to lab with me. And... <laughs> oh, yeah, that was what I was looking for. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and they'll suggest a topic of, oh, here's a thing that we could do. But I, I genuinely find it like impossible to create a video on a suggested topic if it doesn't grip me in some way right because making these videos is is a little bit is a little bit of a crazy process and, and so like i've i just i've been in that situation a bunch where it would be really advantageous if i could create a video on topic x and i've tried and those 
always just fizzle fizzle out into like, oh, this is terrible. This is terrible, and it's boring, and it's not interesting, and it's not fun, and I just can't, I just can't make it. But so, it's like, I'm very glad that the videos that have gone up are a, quote, return to form, but it really is mostly just that this topic gripped me uh, a couple months ago, and I, and I, like, I could not, I could not let it go, and... It all started around this idea of, hey, the Statue of Liberty is a national monument. Like, what does that mean? What does it mean to say that it's a national monument? I know these things exist. I don't know anything about them. And I started researching them. And it's like, oh, down the rabbit hole we go, right? Like, it starts to get very complicated. And at one point, I'm thinking, hey, I sort of remember in high school something coming up about New Jersey wanting to steal the Statue of Liberty. Like, what was the deal with that? And and looking into these things. And these two videos, in my mind, are, were basically created at the same time, almost as one video. That's why there are two in such a close approximation to each other. Okay. Yeah, you were, you were working on all this at the same time, but it was too much for one, so it kind of got split into two. Yeah, nobody wants a 20-minute long, fast-talking video like that. Like, it would just be way too much. But yeah, so it, it ended up being this, this like weird project that more than anything in a really long time dragged me down into the depths of research hell. Uh, like... I was at the point where it was very interesting, uh, but I was even doing things like listening to the oral arguments at the Supreme Court case in the 90s over Staten Island and Ellis Island and and what was going to happen with those two. It's, it's very interesting to listen to because it's like, man, I've never I've never listened to uh, an oral argument in the Supreme Court before. It's interesting that they have those recordings. I never thought about it. And it's also really interesting to hear that. New York is clearly going to lose from, like, the first two minutes. (laughs) Like, I don't know how the Supreme Court's supposed to work. I imagine that they are just neutral angels who just decide things in in terms of righteousness. But it sure seemed like they had pre-decided that New York was going to lose, and we're we're not very happy with that. But anyway, it was interesting, like, going through all of this stuff and ending up in the process of trying to figure out which which thing belongs in which video and i know when people watch the finished videos it can seem like it's obvious that oh the statue of liberty is a separate story that doesn't really have anything to do with federal land and federal land is a completely separate story that doesn't really have anything to do with the statue of liberty but when you don't yet know what the videos are it's it's not at all obvious so it 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 takes a long time to sort out these two parts and to say what goes over here and and what goes over there but i don't think i've ever had two videos where the script to the next one was so close to finish when i finished the first one but it was because mm-hmm. it was like this this siamese twin of of things that of, of things that I just kept coming across. It's like, oh, they're all related and eventually settling on here's the two constellations of of what this one should be about and what that one should be about. So it seems like, like I kind of, I get what you're saying, right? That it's like these things, you have to be interested in them to make them. So mm-hmm. to be interested in them, I know for you begins with like the research because that's where I guess the story ends up being found is like can you find enough interesting material to build from and Mm -hmm. so i guess it's that right like if if the research doesn't work the videos won't work and i know that the research is like an incredibly important part of it all for you yeah in in some ways it feels like a little bit like mining where you're you're digging around and tons of stuff that you're working through is dirt Mm-hmm. But you have to, you have to you have to go through all of it to try to find the things that are the little the little gems of like oh this is an interesting piece of information. I think I understand that. Yeah. Right. But I think where you do it really intensively, I do it every single week. Right. Like for for mm-hmm. all of the shows that I do is like here's all of the news. Right. <laughs> yes. You, you've got to pick <laughs> the things that are worth talking about, and they could and they're not always like 
completely obvious because sometimes the biggest Apple related story of the week absolutely is the most boring thing, right? So for example, there was a video about the iPads being bent by the guy who bends iPads and it was everywhere, but I had literally no interest in discussing it, even though it was the biggest story because there's no discussion. Like, congratulations, you bent an iPad. (laughs) I feel, I feel really happy for you, right? But it's not a story. Um, But then you end up finding like, oh, there was this little thing that was kind of interesting, maybe is funny and we'll talk about it instead. Yeah, you also have, like, I have this problem too, but you have it in much more of an intense way where when you're digging through the gigantic slush pile of the news, like, I imagine you're also a little bit triangulating against what other people are going to talk about. Like, yes, exactly. that, that, That thing of this story may be somewhat interesting, but by the time the discussion goes up, like it will have been talked to death and, yep. and trying to be like, Oh, it's not just like picking the story. It's like picking the story and then trying to find an angle, which you hope is interesting and unique enough. Mm. I do not envy you for that, which I, I, I know I don't always hit that, but I always am trying for it. Right. And, and I think a lot of the time we're able to, and like, it's the same with this show as well. Like what can you find that's mm. interesting to talk about in a specific thing? And you just hope that you find it. Right. But, but it's all, it's all down to research. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting the way different people work on this stuff. And, um, I don't know if I've mentioned it before on the show, but, uh, do you, do you, uh, do you know the YouTube channel, every frame of painting? Yes. So did you ever read their quitting YouTube article that they wrote? No, I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, so find find it for the show notes. They wrote this long article about why they were stopping the YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, which made everybody sad because like they're they for listeners who don't know, they they did what you what you have I guarantee you've seen a million of on YouTube is these video essays about movies. Yep. And I think almost every one of the video essays about movies channels can directly point their lineage right back to every frame of painting which i think solidified the genre and also is unparalleled like their their videos were so good and so interesting and in their article about leaving youtube one of the things that i find very fascinating was they talked about their research process for doing this And I would always, I would aspire to this, although I could never possibly do it. One of their rules was no internet sources. So when they were researching videos, they wouldn't use the internet. Like they wouldn't, they wouldn't type into Google to find out information about the movie they were making an essay on. They 100% went to the library to find books about things. Oh my God. We're in, well, yes, but I think about that and I think, why did they do that? And yeah. one, of, one of the reasons is, if they're thinking of it in terms of mining, the internet is already this well-mined area. And now in the modern age, the library and physical printed books are a much more untapped resource. Like if you're if you're making a video essay about The Shining, there's a million people who want to do that and who will look for articles about The Shining. But there are for sure very serious film enthusiasts who have written books about The Shining that are are much less likely to be come across. And so if you're trying to do background reading on a topic, you're going to find maybe more gemstones that other people haven't found on this topic if you're using a high quality source that maybe fewer people use well and i guess the the inverse of it as well is if you want to be original yeah and you don't look at any youtube videos you're more likely i guess to be less like other youtube videos yeah and ever since i read that article i've I've always thought about that and i've I view that as a platonic ideal to aim for, but it's something I know I'll never achieve. Like the internet is just too useful. Um, but it is it is very useful to try to dig down into other sources. And it's such an interesting thing. Like I, w- I was talking to Kurtz Gazat. I know you can pronounce that channel very well. Kurtz Gazat. Very good. At my 
EduTube conference that I was attending. And I have to do it, Mike. You're just asking it for it. Uh-huh. But it was interesting. Like, we were talking about this thing that happens where let's say you're trying to do all your background reading for a video that you want to produce and you're doing it entirely online. It is terrifying how often you find these these little loops of internet articles or like newspaper articles that that all reference each other in a circle that closes right where and it's like how 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 on earth does this happen where a thing just becomes a thing that everybody starts to reference and it's very hard to know like where did this thing originally come from Mm. um and i ran into a few of those with this with this video in particular which did did end up with me attempting to go down a little bit more the route of let me try let me try to find things that people probably haven't gone across if they're making a video on this topic like or if or if videos on this topic already exist and yeah it was it was very interesting but i definitely ended up much more obsessive about this topic than than some of the ones in the past and it did end up with me actually going into a library and getting books like physical books and newspapers on this topic to do some of the background reading and it was a it was a really interesting it was a really interesting experience but i thought i I thought i would mention it to you mike because there's a there's a funny cortex crossover here so you may remember two episodes ago I said something like, oh, I don't use my iPad anymore. And it just lays on the table and I don't touch it. I don't think you said those exact words. I think that you wouldn't want to break my heart that way. I, I don't remember <laughs> you saying that. It may have been what you were thinking, but it, they weren't the words you said. I'm sure of it. Yeah, they weren't exactly the words I said, but it was, you know, the, the gist of it. But so literally two days after that episode went up, I, like I fell off into the like, I'm doing the deep, deep reading on this topic now. And some of the books I, I was trying to get a hold of, like no joke, books from the 1800s about the history of New York and New Jersey, trying to trace some things down. I had to get membership in a couple of special libraries to be able to get these books because like they just don't exist online. And the main research library that I was using had a no computers rule the rule was you can come into the library and you can have pen and paper but you can't you can't bring a computer because the typing sounds of a keyboard are too offensive in a serious research library which i can actually get behind i was uh very annoyed and surprised when i showed up with my gigantic 15 inch macbook pro like hi i want to look at some of your books uh and there's there's, no (laughs) you will not be able to do that um but so i found i found a loophole and what do you think that loophole was mike Was, was it typing on a glass screen okay so i asked them and like well next time i come i have an ipad can I use this? And they say, will you be typing? And I go, of course not. I won't be typing at all. There's no keyboard on this thing. In fact, it's just going to be on the screen a picture of a piece of paper that I will be writing on with a pencil. And the librarian paused. Pondered this fantastical technology. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the rule is paper and a pencil. I was like, well, this device is literally called a pencil. And I'm going to have a picture of a piece of paper. Like, how, how close can I get? And it was deemed that bringing an iPad into the research library was perfectly acceptable. And then I ended up having, like, this was going, you remember I was talking about how, like, oh, things are so great. Like, I'm just having these perfect nail them out of the park days working on stuff. Again, I think that was an episode or so ago. So I, I, I never like to talk about videos when I'm, working on them and i've i've like like a fool i've broken that rule a couple of times in my life and i have always regretted it yeah it it never goes well like it doesn't it doesn't go well. yeah it just never goes well the the only time i will talk about a video is like once the audio has been recorded 
and the basic animations are done, then I feel like, oh, this rock is already starting to roll downhill and there's nothing to stop it. But I've always regretted talking about the videos before that process. It always feels like it just deflates it. And so I was working on these two videos then. But I was also just, I was in like the world's most pleasant working routine. It's like, this is how I know life is going smooth. It's like I would get up, I would go into my glass cube, I would do a couple hours of writing, and then when I felt myself start to flag with the writing, I picked up my old iPad Pro, brought it with me, trucked off like I was in school again to the library, uh, and spent another couple of hours at the library every day just with the iPad and like going through some of the research material that I had gotten librarians to get for me. And just really spending the time to read a bunch of these very boring old documents. And it was great. Like, boy, was that just a perfect little routine for me to be in. And for you, Mike, this this gift that I have for you is that I, I do want to say that I feel like I've found the new role for the iPad in my life, mm -hmm. which is the iPad is this little research companion ah this is this is great like this is the role for this thing and then once i thought about it in that way i started to use it very intentionally in that way like if i'm ever in video reading or research mode do it on the ipad like sit in a comfy chair sit back and use this as the device to go through all your Evernote notes or like read or highlight PDFs on whatever the topic is. Uh, or like have this as the companion that you're using when you're reading an actual book and you're trying to you're trying to get in under the wires of a fussy library's rules. This episode of Cortex is brought to you by our friends at Squarespace. You can make your next move with Squarespace because they will let you easily create the website you want for your next idea or project. Squarespace give you all of the tools that you're going to need. They have 24-7 customer support if you need any help with anything. They give you the ability to sign up for a domain name. They have award-winning template options available and so much more. All of Squarespace's beautiful templates are really easily customizable. You can change things just the way that you want. Everything's drag and drop. What you see is what you get. It is super, super easy and super simple to customize a Squarespace website. And it has all of the functionality available to you that you're going to need. No matter what type of website you want to make, Squarespace has the tools. They have blog functionality. They have portfolio functionality. They even let you add an online store if you want to. There is nothing to install or patch or upgrade to Squarespace, they take care of all of that stuff so you don't have to. I've used Squarespace for my own projects for probably 10 years now. There is nowhere else that I would go if I wanted to start a website today because it's super simple, I know how to use it, and I don't have to get buried trying to understand a bunch of code beforehand. Squarespace plans start at just $12 a month, but you can start a trial today with no credit card required. Just go to squarespace.com slash cortex. Then when you sign up, use the offer code cortex. This will get you 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain and show your support for this show. Once again, that's squarespace.com slash Cortex and the code Cortex for 10% off your first purchase. Our thanks to Squarespace for their support of this show, Squarespace. Make your next move, make your next website. It's interesting because it feels to me like you have reverted back to the stage that you were at before the iPad became your primary computer. Like this was the kind of stuff you were doing yeah. before that it seems like you'd maybe kind of lost sight of. No, I, I I think that is 100% correct. And I find it interesting that this is this is the cycle of like, oh, I liked it so much, I turned it into the main computer. And I don't expect to really ever go back to it being the main computer, as long as we have computers and iPads as they currently exist. But it is it is like a rediscovery of the role of this device in this specific way. And also just yeah, it just takes advantage of all of of all of the power of it. Like being this is where like being able to use the pencil and like oh god and all these boring boring government report PDFs being able to like go through and mm -hmm. and highlight them in Evernote and just something about doing it with the pencil is very different. Are you still doing your like marking up of scripts? 
Are you doing that with the iPad? Yeah, I'm still doing that. Okay. I'm still doing that. It really fe- feels like it's found its place again then, honestly. Like, and this is the thing. It's like, I consider, I call my iPad my main computer just because I sit with it more. But it it also has its place for me. Mm. And its place for me is like communication and administration. Like, mm. I think it's the perfect machine for that. And and that's where it fits for me. But I'm sitting right now in front of my iMac because that's where I feel most comfortable recording and editing shows right now. That's just, that's how it works for me. But like, mm-hmm. it, it is a device that's definitely has a very, very important place. Like one of the, one of, you know, I have two very important uses for computers and that fills mm. one of them. Like it has its place for me. And, you know, that's real work. What you're doing is real work. Real work is always brought up. But, you know, (laughs) I I don't think that you have to say that a device can completely replace another device for it to be real work or not. You're you're doing your real work on your iPad. Yeah. And and I still love the idea of like this futuristic tablet as being the only thing that you need. And I think that's like that's the romance and that's the attraction of the iPad. But yeah, it's... I'm just very pleased with it. Like, and, and I was having just a, like a fantastic time where, where everything in life seems to come together just right. It's like, oh, I'm really interested in this topic. I'm really on schedule with my routine of writing. And then I have this device that's doing exactly what I want it to do, being this friendly assistant that is helping me with this other area of, of my life. And it was like, ah, this is just, this is just, fantastic and everything everything was firing on all cylinders i will say this makes me very happy to hear well i wanted to talk about it last time and then well when behind the scenes everyone sometimes topics are intended to be talked about and we don't talk about them and so i had put like ipad on the bullet points for last week yep. and you said you want you last said you week. wanted to skip it oh sorry <laughs> sorry <laughs> Look, f- future listeners won't know when this goes up, right? People working sure. their way through the back catalog will have mm-hmm. no idea. Last yeah. yesterday, yesterday. Right? Um, so I had put iPad on the on the list, and when we were recording, I can't remember why, but you decided like, oh, let's not let's not talk about it this week. I think we've talked about too much Apple stuff, so you said like, let's cut it. And I didn't want to say anything, but at the time, like, my heart sunk because I thought, oh, Mike, I have like a little gift for you. I want to talk to you about how how I found this place for the iPad again. Let me say how it was written in our document. Gray gives the iPad its due, one particular use case that has been great recently. I was just like, that sounds boring. Like, he's just going to tell me, like, <laughs> oh, it's the greatest tool to read Reddit on, but I don't read Reddit or something. You know, like, it's just like, it's not really going to give me what I want. Like, if it would have uh-huh. said, like, Gray is going to make Mike happy again because he's using the iPad more, then I, that would have been bumped up to topic number one. Yeah, but I didn't want to spoil it, Mike. No, it's good. But I said, that's why it's like, but now, you know, here we are. I will say something, though, because this, this might wrap it around to make it an even more fun episode for me. Earlier, you referenced my old iPad Pro. Mm-hmm. Did you buy a new iPad? I mean, look, <laughs> in America, iPads are a lot cheaper. And uh, yeah, nice try yeah. on that one. They're not really, but that's, that was a really good <laughs> attempt to, to come up with an excuse as to why you bought it. No, it's, it's way cheap. It's like everything in America is like a 50% off sale, or at least it was right. eight years ago. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, so I did buy a new iPad. Although okay. I must say, I was genuinely kind of annoyed at first because the iPad had wormed its way back into my life like three weeks before whatever that event was. And then the Apple event happened, which, sidebar here, I had, didn't realize was happening. And I uploaded my first video in the middle of the Apple event, which I would have never done in a thousand years yep. if I had been online and know what was, knew what was going on. Oh, I just wanted to give a quick correction before I get to that. I was completely wrong. It's way cheaper in the US. So I would like to retract my previous <laughs> statement. But yeah, I did at the time because the Apple event was going on and you posted your video and I think I sent you a message of like, do you know there's an Apple event right now? And you're like, oh no, Um, I forgot. I was like, oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. So you were the one who alerted me to the fact that there was an Apple event occurring. Well, because this is one of those things where every now and then you do something and people send me messages. This was one of them of like, why has he done this right now? It still makes me uncomfortable that this happens. I don't I, like, it's weird to me that people send you messages about what I'm up to, but yep. uh, yeah, I could see that this would be one of those moments. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes when people ask, what's the downside of, of not 
being on the internet. That's a clear moment that I can point to is I picked yep. maybe the worst moment in the world to upload the video because yep. I just had no idea. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the video went up and then I was immediately busy on on trying to get the federal land part done as quickly as possible. And so I I actually didn't really know anything about the new iPads or hadn't even seen one in person until just a few days ago in Alabama when I discovered there was an Apple store nearby and I, and I wandered in. And I was like, "Oh, let me just let me take a look at let me take a look at these iPads." Uh, you know, like you're going into uh like you're going in to a pet store just to look at the puppies, yep. right? Like that's yep. that's what it was. Mm-hmm. I was like, "Oh, let me just let me just see what these iPads are like. Oh, how cute are they? Let me just pick one up and hold it. Oh, how how light, how nice this iPad is. Ooh, this pencil, it snaps on the side. That's very cool. Uh, so, yeah, of course, I, I totally walked out of the store with, with an iPad. And I really love it. I really it's, love it, Mike. It's amazing. <laughs> like, <laughs> Tell me what you think about it. Uh, it. I love everything about it. Like, I've had it for about a month, right? Mm-hmm. Multiple weeks at this point. I have both of them, of course. Hashtag multipad lifestyle. Right. This is like my favorite Apple industrial design, maybe ever, at least in the last 10 years. Whoa. It sings on every level. There is nothing wrong with it. But I just, I can't find anything wrong with this. There's, there doesn't feel like there's any compromises. The only, I guess the only minor frustration is the removal of the headphone jack, but like I can just deal with that. I only ever use the headphone jack on my iPad when I'm on a plane. So mm-hmm. I just bought a dongle. I attached it to my headphones. It's in my backpack and it will never leave those headphones. So like situation mm-hmm. controlled, right? Like it's yeah. it's not a problem. Everything else is just perfect. I love the flat sides. It is unbelievably thin. You may not know this, but you know it's thinner than any iPhone they've ever made. Wait, it's thinner than any iPhone? This is the thinnest iOS device ever made. It's like, where's my where's my phone? That can't be right. It's 100% true. This is one of those things I figured because, you know, you don't listen to podcasts or anything or just do anything anymore. I figured I could give you that fact and you wouldn't have known it. I, I mean, look, I, 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 don't, I don't mean to put this burden onto you, Mike, but Cortex is now my Apple News podcast. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. I, I have absolutely no doubt that all of our listeners will be very happy to, to understand this fact so we can just talk about it more. I'm sure they will. So the new iPads, both of them, are 5.9 millimeters thick. The new mm. iPhones are 7.7 millimeters thick. It really seems impossible. It does, doesn't it? Like you, uh, I forget it a lot, like because it just doesn't seem like it could be fathomable. How could you do that? But they did it. I mean, this is this part of the reason that I love this device because there are parts of it where it's like I have no. It doesn't make any sense why you did that, but I love that you did it. Like the bezels mm-hmm. on both the devices, on the eleven and the twelve point nine, they're the same thickness. Hmm. It's just little things like that where I'm like. That's wonderful. Like I'm, I, I love that you did that. Thank you for doing that. Um, I adore them. I think that they're absolutely beautiful. They're wonderful to hold. USB C. I'm really intrigued about the possibilities of it. It has at least made my uh, charging easier to deal with. There's, it still needs a lot. Um, it needs some work to like really kind of make that port shine. But I am very confident that iOS 13 is gonna we're going to see some crazy stuff for these iPads. It reminds me of um, the iPad Air 2, right? So the iPad Air 2 came out and it was really powerful for what iOS could deliver. Mm. And then in June, iOS 9 came out with multitasking. Right, right. So like, it feels like that again to me. This machine is incredibly powerful. It's powerful than most of the laptops. It's more powerful in Geekbench scores than most of the laptops that Apple sells right now. It has USB-C, this incredible screen. Like, I think it's a great time to to love the iPad right now, and I am I feel blessed with the hardware that I've been given. Every <laughs> part of it, every single part of this whole package is I find better. Like, I the Apple Pencil, I am just I have fallen head over heels in love with that thing all over again. 
<laughs> like I, I, I'm full of hyperbole with these new devices, but you know, I've I've thought about it and talked about it enough now that I feel confident in this. Like I think the app, the Apple Pencil Two, is probably the best version two of any product Apple's ever made. Like hmm. they took everything that was frustrating about it and completely fixed every part of it. I, I just I also had this little moment where I I realized, oh, of course, Mike has talked about this iPad on lots of shows already Mm -hmm. over the last, whatever it is, three weeks that Mm -hmm. it's been out. And somehow I I, like, I think, I think in my head, I sort of thought if I don't listen to your shows, they don't happen. (laughs) Right. Whereas like, I'm used to listening to you talk about the things on other shows. And then we, then we talk about it. It's like, I'm aware of that. It's like, Oh, of course. Yeah. So you, like you can be, very confident in these statements they are distilled now. yeah like you've been through the internet winds of saying it and then like buffeted by the comments and pushed back and like that's outrageously hyperbole right and you're like no no i think it is true uh so, so yeah I, I i'm enjoying getting this this distilled version of your thoughts yeah this is the triple filtered version of my thoughts right it's, <laughs> this is these are the purest thoughts let me tell you why the apple pencil is so great now right okay uh it's smaller and it's got a better weighting to it throughout so it's better balanced it makes it easier Mm. to hold the magnetic storage and inductive charging is unbelievable like i cannot believe that they did this because it's so good like it feels like Mm -hmm. it's too good to have done it yeah so going from sticking the lightning port into the bottom of the ipad which whilst inelegant i still remain was the best thing they could have done with that technology you know, like being able to charge the pencil with the device you're using it on was the best thing to do. So trying to stick it into a wall to charge it was a stupid idea and that never would have worked. Like they did the best thing they could at the time, but being able to just pop it on the top of the iPad and it charges is incredible because it's always where you want it to be, which is stuck to the iPad. And because every mm-hmm. time it's stuck to it, it's charging, it's always charged. So I use my Apple Pencil more than ever now because it's so easy to get, you just reach up and grab it, and it's always ready to go. Like, always. It's there, it's ready to go, it's where, it's there when you need it. And that has made it a even more valuable tool for me. Yeah, it, it's gone from, I always have to plug in the pencil, which I agree, I think people poo-pooed that charging solution more than was deserved. Like so here's the thing, you know, here's the, here's the yeah. thing on this. And, and I think a lot of the criticism, <laughs> and look, I, I think a lot of the criticism over the way the iPads function and work typically is by people that don't use them that much so they don't Mm. get it right but like if you used the apple pencil every day like we did you understand that whilst stupid and ugly and dangerous you want to be able to charge it with the device yeah right like that was the best thing you could have done with what you had it's now a million times better but you think it's inelegant and you laugh at it i think when you're not using it because if you're only mm. ever charging it every once in a while, it does seem stupid because you lose the cap or whatever. But I prefer to have an Apple Pencil where I've lost the cap than to be on a plane and need to go and find my adapter so I can plug it into the back of the airplane seat to charge it. Mm. You know? Yeah, I think you might be right about that. Um, it, I mean, it, I do love this inductive charging so much better because mm-hmm. always the things that I like what what's one less thing that I have to consider at all? Yeah. And now the amount of charge in the pencil is something I just never have to consider. It's, like, I, it's I haven't never thought flat. about it once. It's yeah. never flat. Because you're never going to use it for an amount of time that you would even run the battery down, right? Like in most mm-hmm. cases, it's very likely that you would take a break within the multiple hours of charge that it has. And then you just pop, pop it right. down where it's supposed to go and it will juice up again, right? So like... It's it's kind of perfect. I love it. <laughs> I'm so happy you're happy, Mike. They're amazing. And I'm still doing both of them, even though the, the smaller one is 11 inches. Like, it's still... The benefits are the same for me, where, like, the 13 is still too much screen for a lot of the cases that I need, for a lot of the use cases that I have for it. Like, if I'm in bed and reading or watching videos or whatever, 13-inch screen is a bit too much. Um, but the 11 is is great for that. Um, and But there is a thing now which has never happened before when sometimes I'm looking at my iPad and I'm like, which one is this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, sometimes I'm just not 100% sure which one is which. 
It's the bezel-less because it throws off your only frame of reference. Yeah. I, like now, I I didn't get two iPads right, because I'm not I'm not I'm not now the the holder of the mantle of the multi-pad lifestyle. Yep, I've taken that. I'm running with it. Yeah, that's that's yours. You run with it. Uh, I simply got the bigger one because it, it's just like it was a total no-brainer of. If I'm looking at some PDF from a research paper, like I want it as big on the screen as it can yep. be, and I want as much space to write notes, it's a, it's a total no decision. Something they kept saying in the marketing is now that that device is the same size as an A4 piece of paper. Oh, is it? Yeah, and that they said oh, that's, that's one of the reasons they decided to bring the bezels in rather than make the screen bigger is they felt like that that was a was like a really prime size for for most people. Mm. Hmm, I may have to redo my papers a little bit because mm -hmm. they don't quite fit perfectly anymore. So I'll have to work on that. But uh, what was I going to say? All right. No, no bezels throws off your frame of reference. And so I don't have two iPads to wonder which one is it. But I do that with my phone all the time. Like the, I have the big phone and I look at it and constantly think, wait, is that the big one? Or is that the, like, is that the other one? And it's because you just don't have the bezels to know mm -hmm. the proportion of the screen versus what's not the screen. I think it, it's... I don't know. It's it's not like an optical illusion, but it's just there's nothing for your brain to perch onto. It's just a black rectangle, and you're not that good at judging the size of black rectangles just in the abstract. Face ID is so much better on the iPad than any other device. I love it. I find it really cute how when you go to open the screen, it'll put the little arrow to be like, yeah. hey, buddy, you're covering the Face ID camera. <laughs> like, I don't know why. It's cute. I don't know why. It makes me smile every time. So I hear a lot of people say, right, that like Apple's lost its whimsy, right, that they used to have a lot of whimsy in their design. You know, things like uh, when you would empty the, oh no, when you drag something out of the dock on the Mac and it would like poof into a little like mm -hmm. plume of smoke, right? I feel like this is very whimsical, like this little arrow that's pointing over here. And the iPad itself is telling you, like, two faces too far away or like, hey, you're covering the camera up. Like, silly, you know, like it's it kind of has yeah. a, a delightfulness in the way that the copy is written in the UI and the way that it indicates to you that it can't see you. I, I think they did a really good job of it. Every time something comes up about you've covered up the camera, it's iPad peekaboo. That, that's what it feels yep. like we're playing. It's like, oh, it's adorable. Like, peekaboo, I see you now, iPad. I've moved my hand. Uh, it's, it's great. It's, it's, it's really cute. Um, I, I, will, I will have to just put in, for me, one thing that, that is a, a really big deal, which also goes back to what some of my original frustrations were with the iPad. But it's not... Face ID is great, but what matters even more to me is that because Face ID is there, now the user interface for my phone and my iPad is the same again. Yeah, it makes it makes more sense. Like whilst they had the gestures, they weren't fully baked in and it made it all feel weird and and it has become more fluid again now that yeah. the basic fundamentals of these devices have unified, which does make sense, I think. Yeah. I still like I still have all of my weird grumbles about I find it clunky when I want to do some additional thing. Mm -hmm. But what is what I really love now is that swipe back and forth gesture, which I don't use a lot on my phone, is the like the perfect and most valuable way on my iPad to do the thing that I'm doing if I'm at the library a lot, which is I have Evernote on the screen, and then I want to slide over to Good Notes and write something by hand, and then slide back to Evernote and you know continue looking at a PDF or whatever. That fluid gesture, taking away the little bit of resistance of doing the home home yep. button double tap, plus also the oh I have to remember I'm using an iPad, I'm not using my phone, I have to press the button, I can't swipe on the screen. That makes it a little. It makes the device a little bit more invisible it makes it much more like oh it's just here i'm just using this thing in in a natural way so that that bar on the bottom to swipe back and forth between good notes and kindle or good notes and evernote is like i've used that a thousand times on the ipad and it's it's great it, it feels really natural so that that to me is really the biggest deal of anything is the user interface experience is now consistent everywhere and i don't feel like i'm breaking my brain switching back and forth between devices 
Today's episode is also brought to you by Casper, the company focused on sleep, dedicated to making you exceptionally comfortable one night at a time. You spend a third of your life sleeping. If you spend a third of your life doing anything, don't you want it to be the best thing it can possibly be? And that's why you need Casper, because their mattresses, they are perfectly designed for humans. They're engineered to soothe and support your natural geometry. They have all the right support in all the right places. Casper mattresses are so comfortable because they combine multiple supportive memory foams for a quality mattress with just the right sink and bounce. And that's really important, right? So on a Casper mattress, when you sit down on it, you don't sink into it. When you sit down on it, you don't bounce everything that's sitting on the bed onto the floor. You know, that could be an animal, maybe a pet. Who knows? You don't want to do that. Casper mattresses are perfectly balanced. You get all the right support in all the right places, and they are so comfortable because of this. What's even better is that they're breathable, so they doesn't get super hot at night, which is wonderful. So a Casper mattress is going to keep you nice and cool throughout the night. Their mattresses are designed and developed in the US, and they have over 20,000 reviews online of an average rating of 4.8 stars. Hey, Casper is becoming the internet's favorite mattress, and it's easy to see why, especially when you look at the 100-night risk-free sleep on it trial that Casper does. They will deliver direct to your door, and if for any reason you don't love it they have a hassle-free return policy and one of the other amazing things about casper is when they deliver it to you you will be surprised as i have been about how small the box is that it comes in if you live in an apartment building like me the idea of getting a mattress to your apartment is a horror but with Casper, it's shipped in a box that you can very easily carry up the stairs. Super, super awesome. And now is the perfect time to give Casper a try yourself or to gift Casper to somebody that you care about. If you're looking for a great Cyber Monday deal or a Black Friday savings, go to casper.com savings right now to get 10% off your order with any Casper mattress for a limited time only. Now, this offer expires November 27th, so hurry up and go get that mattress. Terms and conditions apply. That's casper.com slash savings to save 10% on your entire order with any Casper mattress for a limited time only. Terms and conditions apply. And once again, November 27th is when this offer expires. Our thanks to Casper for their support of this show and Relay FM. I'm very excited for iOS 13. <laughs> I bet you are, Mike. <laughs> this USB-C port, what, what is it there for? <laughs> USB-C is interesting. It's not right now the most interesting thing to me like i just think that you know we've spoken about this a bunch in the past like if you're all in on a company you know like like we are with apple devices like these are the devices that we've chosen to use this is the ecosystem that we're a part of it is it it makes you feel good when the company is putting a lot of effort into the thing you use yeah and it feels like they put a lot of effort into this ipad which just makes me feel confident that ios 13 it's going to have a lot of effort put into it for the iPad. And there's a lot of stuff I want to see, right? But I think that there's going to be some stuff that splits the iPad and the iPhone apart again. Um, mm. You know, like there's been a lot of rumors of a revised home screen, which I really think is time for the iPad. Oh, yeah. I, I would love to see stuff like a little bit more widget-like or something with shortcuts, right? Like how could shortcuts make the home screen better? And I was Mm. thinking about this recently, and I want to see what you think about this. On the Mac, you have Launchpad, right? Which is a way for you to bring up your applications from the dock, right? So you Mm -hmm. press the little button, it shows all your apps. I don't don't understand why the iPad doesn't just have that, and you don't put apps on the home screen anymore. Launchpad, to me, seems like trying to make the Mac into what the iPad currently is what do you what do you want to be well, different I don't I don't it. I don't want the home screen to just be grids of app icons anymore right yeah yeah okay I agree with right you so I feel like you could use the iPad's dock and just hit a little button and it brings up all of your apps and you can just choose them that way oh uh, okay I see you want a launch pad button on, on the, the iPad dock on the iPad right yeah. to make the iPad look like it currently does and then you can do something else more interesting with the screen yes I, I totally agree like yeah, you yeah. could put documents there if you wanted to you could put shortcuts you could put widgets you could put yeah. all kinds of interesting pieces of information so yeah the home screen becomes like a command center and then you're only ever opening apps from the dock I think there there is a problem with that like, a lot of people don't un, like can't get their head around like why does the dock exist? if the home screen exists and like, how do I do multitasking? If do I have to go back to the home screen all the time? It's like everyone that uses the iPad a lot, most of their multitasking is, is action from the dock. 
Mm-hmm. They just swipe up the dock and all the apps that they use in multitasking are there. And the real iPad power users have a folder of little utilities, right, that keep getting brought yep. up. And I think that there is a disconnect between why the dock would exist and why the desktop exists because Mac users don't put app icons very frequently on their desktop, right? Yeah. So like why are they mixed together on the iPad? And I think that a revision to the iPad's home screen will probably bring it closer to the Mac and further away from the iPhone. But I think that's the right thing to do for now. Yeah, they should they should do something. In my ideal world, the the home screen, the background could be built to be something like the Windows phone background. Like here's a bunch of tiles that show me things that's useful to me or buttons yeah. I can press. Yeah. Like it doesn't need to be this grid of icons. Like it's literally a decade ago when we yeah. first thought of this. Like we can we can do more now. Look at any Android phone, right? It is possible to put useful pieces of information just there, right? Yeah. Like, I don't want to have to swipe to the left to get to Spotlight anymore. Like, Spotlight should just be on the home screen, mm. right? So I could just tap it and search for something if I want to. Like, like I'm, I'm keen to see what a kind of starting place for a computer could be in 2019 if you think it through again. Like, what does mm-hmm. that end up being? And again, it's just like, what is the workflow team for? Like, why did they get them? Why did they want to do shortcuts? Like, I feel like this makes more sense. I've been spending time thinking a little bit about home screens in general and putting them around actions, you know, like we've been talking about recently. I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about that. Like, what does that mean? And that's just something I've had rolling around in my head at the moment, so... I am very excited for iOS 13 because I love my iPad Pro so much. They're really, really wonderful. I'm so happy for you, Mike. I'm glad you're happy with your new iPad. I'm happy for you. (laughs) Welcome back. Welcome back. (laughs) I'm happy for me too. (laughs) Cortexmerch.com. Cortexmerch.com. We have two uh, limited edition products going on right now. One of them, very excited about this, Cortexmas Pins. It is the season of Cortexmas, and we are currently selling. We have a limited edition run of glow in the dark Cortexmas tree pins. They are wonderful, and you can get those now at cortexmerch.com. It's glow in the dark so that you can always know that it is Cortexmas all the time. Exactly. Cortexmas should extend for as long as possible, and so you need to be able to see the Cortex pin as long as possible. The sun will never set on Cortexmas. That's. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what I want, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing uh, a short second run of the subtlety. This is So we work with uh, Cotton Bureau for our uh, production. They're an incredible partner for Cortex Merch. And they're doing a promotion right now called All the Teas, which includes a giveaway of some awesome stuff. So the su- subtlety is on sale until December the 4th. Um, and I will say, Gray, I am wearing my subtlety right now. Mine, mine came very recently from the first run that we did. I am so happy with this product. Like it, it perfectly fits the idea that I had, which is I have a Cortex t-shirt now that I can wear to all manner of functions. Like I went for a nice lunch this afternoon with some family and I could wear my Cortex t-shirt because it just looks like a nice fancy t-shirt that I own because it has this lovely little embroidered logo on it. So we are selling them right now until December 4th. I don't know when they will be on sale again. Um, I will say, of all the merch that we have done, this is my favorite item now. So I think it is in your best interest if you are interested to go and get one um, as they're on sale for just a short period of time. But also now at CortexMerch.com, you will find our permanent line of products, which includes a hat, a hoodie, a tee, and a pin, all featuring the regular blue Cortex logo. They will always be there now whenever you want to get them at CortexMerch.com. But we have our limited edition products. So go right now, cortexmerch.com. There's always a lot going on at cortexmerch.com. So that's why you should check in frequently. Right, yeah. You should check in every week with cortexmerch.com. Like that, you, you should definitely do that because you never know. Limited sales, new stuff to get. I just got a bunch of uh, Cortex pins delivered to me. They're fantastic. Mm-hmm. I love them. The subtlety is is so good that I can, like, I can make myself get over how much I don't like 
the fact that the name is a pun, but you're so pleased about that and the shirt it's is so pun? good, I can say I it. I don't know what you're talking about. It's just a subtle t-shirt. It's God damn it, Mike. I don't know what you mean. Yeah, so things always happening at CortexMerch.com. Go check it out. Okay, Cortex Book Club time. The Effective Executive by Peter Drucker. <sighs> so, Mike. Hmm. All right, I need to tell you. I need to tell you a little story. Okay. About me and this book, and you have to not get angry. All right. Because I didn't finish my homework. Uh, but but there's more. There's more to it than that. Because so this book had been sitting in my Kindle library for forever as a book that a bunch of people had recommended and I vaguely thought I should read at some point and then suggested it again without without saying it was good always wanted to be clear for Cortex Book Club just just suggesting it as a thing to read to try it out and I figured now will be the time that I read the book so a couple weeks ago I thought gotta get started on this gotta read this book homework time open up my Kindle download the effective executive, start reading. And what do I see but a highlight? And I go, huh, that's weird. How is this highlight in this book? It must be some, it seems like something I would highlight, but I haven't read this book. I don't know how that happened. So I keep reading. And then there's more highlights of exactly the sorts of sentences that I would highlight. <laughs> and then eventually a note from myself to me in the margins with a highlight. I had read this book already, Mike. Oh. But when I read it the first time, I didn't finish it then either. Mm, okay. <laughs> and I had, when I suggested that we do it for the show, no memory at all of having ever read the book. And I, and I, made, a, I made a very game, a very game second attempt at reading it, but I also... I also petered out maybe two chapters farther than I had I had made it the first time. Okay. So I have to apologize to you, and I have to apologize to all the Cortex listeners. I didn't finish it, and I also didn't remember that I read it. I will say this is it is very valid because this book really peters out in like the, the final third. Oh, okay. I feel less bad then. <laughs> Yeah, it really, like, a lot of the, the stuff that I found most interesting in this book was contained in the first half of it, um, and then a lot of it, for, for a couple of reasons. One, it, it, it starts talking about stuff that just doesn't really apply to me or you anymore, like, it talks about a lot of, like, managing conflict resolution in small teams and hmm. how to be effective. Like, so the idea is, like, the, the book is focused around, you know, as all these are, the title is what the book is about, which is about being an effective executive. I like the term and I like the way that this book is focused on it's about you as an individual being the most effective person you can be. There's not mm. too much focus on leadership in this book or like being the best leader that you can it's mostly focused on like what you can do to be the most effective person in the organization you're a part of so i liked it for that and that's what it's about like being effective it's not about exec the executive is not about like being a ceo it is about like you being in control of your own effectiveness and how to do that um so it's good, but then it does start to get into some team stuff, which isn't really that interesting. Um, and there is a chapter, uh, I think it's like chapter six or something like that, which is called The Effective Executive and the Computer. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. Oh, man. I forget how old these books are sometimes. <laughs> the Effective Executive by Peter Drucker was written in 1967. Oh my so, god. So I skipped that entire chapter. I don't know. That's so old it would be interesting again, right? Oh, like, I couldn't you know. do it because I was really dying with this book by that point and was looking for any reason to skip. One must have a large number of punch card monkeys assisting them with the computer. <laughs> because before that, like he's making reference to the computer, but like the executive won't be affected by the computer because like 
decisions still need people's thought, and there's no way that the computer will take away decisions. And I was like, oh, Peter Drucker, old 1967 Pete. Like, here's the thing about this book, whilst I'm talking about its age. It's, like, been reissued and reprinted. I cannot believe it has not been updated in a couple of ways. One, that section should just be taken out. And another, now... I'm going to say this. I need to say this because it annoyed me so much, right? I know this book was written in 1967, but there is incessant male gendering throughout this book to the point that it was driving me mad. Like, everyone is referred to as he and him, and only men are executives. Like, and I just feel like it's so easy to change that. Like, you could have just changed it in one of the reprintings. Like, I think it was reprinted, like, three or four years ago. It's not difficult to make a change from, like, he to they. Like, it's really not Mm -hmm. hard. Like, if you've you've reissued the book, like, you can amend it. It's okay. And it's just, it really grated on me over time. And also, like, this book feels like it was written in 1907, (laughs) <laughs> at points, it it's obsessively wordy, almost like a Dickens novel. Like this, just and some of the phrasing is like bonkers. Another thing that drove me mad is the use of one and oneself. Mm-hmm. It makes some sentences unreadable. I am going to read for you my favorite example of this. Right? Okay. One can know about oneself that one usually does a good job working alone on a project from start to finish. Like, why would you write it like that? One wait, can yeah. know about oneself that one. Like it's wait, it, one, wait one can know about, know about oneself. oneself that one usually does. That, a good okay, job. okay, okay. I'm, trying, I'm like mentally putting in commas in this like, sentence. You could just say, one, "You know that you do a good job," or like someone knows they do a good job <laughs> working alone on a project. Right. Like one can know about oneself that one. It, yeah, the the way this book is written is really annoying in places, but annoying for different reasons that these books are usually annoying. I I don't think that there are many of these types of books that have lasted for like 50 years, right? Like this one has. I'm trying to think of a counterexample. And the best counterexample I can come up with is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, which may literally have been written in 190 something. And I don't, I don't know when, but I feel like that was, that was written pre-World War One. But that is also a book that, I mean, at this point, I think they have to write like written by Dale Carnegie in quotes because the the foundation that owns all of his stuff, whenever they do a reprinting, like they update all the stories, like they, they completely yeah. rewrite the book every time they do it. And it's like they're keeping the ideas of that book there. But guess what? An anecdote about CEOs in the 1910s means nothing to anyone now so they're like okay we're just going to get rid of that story and we're going to replace it with another story like there are so many references to like lincoln in this book i mean he he is a very important historical figure mike no but like there's (laughs) gotta be something else right like surely this this version the version that i read was reprinted in 2007 all right let me see if i can find where my version was done uh it hasn't been up it can't have been updated because th- th- it doesn't feel like anything has changed like i really feel that the he him thing would have been changed if they would have changed anything because it's so egregious it's so persistent throughout the entire book that like you wouldn't make a change to a book today and then not also change that because it doesn't change the meaning of anything really like it's not like you're going in and tinkering with what being an effective executive means like it's just like a change to the language but so i I just don't think they changed anything i I was just trying to find when this book was published and i I have i I didn't notice it but there's an author's note in my book that is for the updated version from 2002 (laughs) just already like i don't know what edition i'm reading but i i think yes if uh if any of our listeners dares brave this book when you're reading it you have to interpret the way he says him and his as though it's J.R.R. Tolkien writing about 
the race of man, right? Where he's like, man does this thing and he uses the word man to compare mm-hmm. it to elves and dwarves, right? Like you just have to get that in your mind that is like, oh, it's a name for the whole race. Because <laughs> other- otherwise, yeah, it's uh, like, it's crazy. I didn't realize how old this book was, but I was yeah. very aware of thinking of it like in capital letters every time of like, okay, well then then we can sort of deal with this. But yeah, maybe it may be a little bit of updating of the section Han the executive and his mainframe computer that exists in the basement, like, you could probably take that out. It's probably not very relevant. <laughs> so there aren't a lot of typical... Actually, there are none. None of those, like, sickening fake stories. They don't yeah. exist in this book, which I actually found quite refreshing. Like, the examples that he uses are of named individuals mm-hmm. from real companies, and I found that refreshing. Whilst I didn't necessarily read all of them, and we'll get to why in a little bit, like I at least found that refreshing. However, the introduction of this book did not disappoint. So the foreword is written by somebody else, right? Like it's a, I don't I don't even I don't have the person's name in front of me, but it's not important. I want to read from you the opening of the foreword of the effective executive. Please do, Mike. In December of 1994, I pulled up to Peter Drucker's house in my rental car. I rechecked the address because the house just didn't seem big enough. It was a nice house (laughs) in a neighborhood near Claremont Colleges, bordered tightly by similar suburban houses with two small Toyotas parked in the drive. It would have been a perfect, modestly proportioned home for a professor from the local college. But I wasn't looking for a professor from the local college. I was looking for Peter Drucker, the leading founder of the field of management, the most (laughs) influential management thinker in the second half of the 20th century, the founding father of the Peter F. Drucker Graduate School of Management. But the address matched, so I ambled up to the front door. That's amazing. I wish it I wish it was in my edition. I don't oh, have that. God. That's that is a thing of beauty. <laughs> the introduction then goes on to talk about like how I had never met Peter Drucker before, but he was so warm and welcoming as if we'd been friends for 50 years. Like it's just like Wah! like vomiting all <laughs> over the plane as I'm reading it. I want you to write a forward like that when I write a book. Mike. For you, I will actually. I will do that. I will take that like a hundred percent, and I will write it just like that. So yeah, look, every every business book needs at least a moment of disgusting sycophanty, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's it's just a requirement. So there are there are a bunch of things spoken about in this book, like how to be effective, how to make decisions. And a lot of that stuff was was okay, but it didn't really speak to me. Um, There wasn't anything that I found particularly insightful in those chapters, which are the later chapters. But the first two kind of areas that the book focuses on, I found really interesting. One was uh, the the term of knowledge worker, which I can only assume, because I hear this a lot, I haven't looked into this, but I can only assume that since this book was written in 1969, that Peter Drucker probably coined the term knowledge worker. Yeah, knowing how old this book is, I, I think I would bet you're right that this may be the first appearance of that term. Because I had, I don't know why, I had always, probably because it's the first place I had come across it, I had vaguely assumed that David Allen was like the creation of knowledge work. Yeah. Because the beginning of getting things done, which again is, is a book that like when I tried to reread it, like does not age well. Yep. I've just checked the Wikipedia page. The term was first coined by Peter Drucker in the book called The Landmarks of Tomorrow in 1959. Okay, interesting. So he's the father of this. Well, like this is, if you read this, this is part of his series, right? So like he did a book about knowledge workers and now Mm. knowledge worker is a term that exists in another book. Like effective executive is a term that exists in later books that he wrote. Right. All right. It's it's just interesting. But it's like, I thought that was David Allen because he spends so much time selling you on this idea Mm -hmm. of knowledge work as, as separate from other things. And I remember at the time, like, oh, I... It just crystallized a bunch of thoughts around work, mm-hmm. but it was so dependent on like the modern world and technology. So I'm like, I'm almost kind of curious about how did Peter Drucker define this word originally? But yeah, it's it's that's in, that's very interesting to know. Okay, so his his thinking 
the no- and I like this more actually. The knowledge worker is based around ideas, and so he mm-hmm. splits it into knowledge work and manual work. So here's a couple of quotes that I like. Knowledge work is not defined by quantity. I'm looking at that right now. And neither is knowledge work defined by its costs. Knowledge work is defined by its results. And when I was reading this, like something that struck me, which is like if we think of knowledge work as ideas, like mm-hmm. ideas, they're not like a tradable commodity with volume. Like you can make like a bunch of things, right, that you can sell and maybe you can sell them for a little bit cheaper or you can sell them at scale. Like, But an excellent idea that you have, if it's a really, really good idea, it's not equal to like 10 okay ideas or 50 bad ideas because they don't have a price attached to them. And I found that to be quite an interesting like parallel of like if you think mm. about making a physical thing and just thinking, your thoughts don't have an inherent intrinsic value to them. There wasn't like material cost and markup on these. It's just your ideas are all you have and they're only really useful when you put them into action, but they're not like a tradable thing. And that's like a big difference between people that deal in knowledge and people that deal with making. Hmm. Yeah, like I, I highlighted that section too, and it's it struck me as well because it it is the same thing of particularly like knowledge work is not defined by its cost, which I also in, interpreted that like you're not looking at cost per unit of idea that there are there are some ways in which knowledge work can have tremendous costs, but then also outsized results in a way that physical products simply never could so it doesn't always make sense to think about cost cutting measures in relation to knowledge work in the same way that it does make sense in terms of physical products like you have to think about cost cutting measures in that way yeah so there's a part like later on where they're talking about like decisions like in relating to this stuff where it's kind of a case of because you can't he he says like cost cutting is is pointless. Like when you're doing cost cutting measures, you end up cutting things that there's kind of no point in cutting because there's such minuscule savings. But if you're a cost cutter, you've made effect. You've been effective by cutting that cost, even though there was no point doing it. But mm-hmm. I like something that he says, which is something that I know that me and you both share as a thought anyway. Which is like, if you are making a decision, you ask yourself like, if I stop doing this thing, is it going to affect anything? Mm-hmm. And if it won't then you just stop doing it. Or like another question of like, if knowing everything we know today, someone asked us to do this thing again, would we do it? And if we wouldn't do it, we stop doing that thing. Right. Right. And this is like part of that. I Like it leads into part of the idea. I, I also like a thing about, when you talk about knowledge workers is typically somebody who's coming up with ideas is not actually the person that actually does anything with it. So you give your idea to somebody else who then goes out and does it. Hmm. So like it's a lot of the time, and this isn't always, you know, like because I know that people that are solo or like independent like us, we will typically put a lot of our stuff into production ourselves. But especially if we're working in a company, like if your job is to make decisions and come up with ideas, you probably communicate those to somebody else who then makes an output with them that the knowledge worker is not always tied to the output. Yeah, like... I, I like that stuff. I, I'm trying to think about, like, I'm looking through a bunch of my notes from this book, and it, it's interesting because there are a bunch of parts that I I do really like. And so, like, let me let me take the one that I think is is the best of of this book. <laughs> I wonder what it's gonna be. Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's I think it's not going to be what you think it is. Okay. You, okay. Okay. I'm going to try to. I'm going to guess. You're going to guess it's time tracking. I am going to guess that because it's my favorite part. <laughs> yeah. So he talks about time tracking a lot. That's not actually. It's not actually that. The thing. Okay. The thing that I like the best in this book is, uh, and it's making me laugh now because it's a section where he references Lincoln. Uh, but it's chapter four. I think the start of chapter four is really great and that chapter is called making strength productive Hmm. and like this is okay how how do i want to i want to phrase this delicately this is not a good book like I, i i don't i can't really recommend it but i do think if you are just coming out of 
school, like you've just graduated high school or you've just graduated college, find a library and read the first few pages of chapter four in this book. Because the thing that I find so frustrating about school is it's this machine that produces the opposite of what we want in the real world. In school, you're always taught to focus more time on the thing that you're the worst at. And so it's like, oh, you've gotten an A in science and you've gotten a B in English, but you got a D in geography. So what, what happens now? You're supposed to spend most of your time on geography and ignore the thing that you're actually good at. Mm -hmm. And it's like you spend two decades under this propaganda of you're supposed to be a well-rounded individual. Whereas the real world doesn't care at all about what you're bad at, right? The, the real world only cares about what you're good at. And I can't, like, it's so personal for me because it's like spelling. My whole life, like, I failed spelling in school constantly and everyone was like, you got to spend more time on spelling. And guess what? Now that I'm an adult, it doesn't matter at all. Like, it doesn't make any difference. Nobody cares that I can't spell. Like, it's not a skill that holds me back. It just doesn't matter. And... Like, I just, I really like the way he focuses on a few things here. And he's focusing on it from both angles of, like, you need to find what you're really good at and double down on. And I also like that he really focuses on if you're in a position of working with other people, you should be able to overlook their flaws. You know, and it's like where he talks about Abraham Lincoln. But he's like, you know, Lincoln picked generals who were, like, men who had tremendous flaws yep. but they were good at winning battles and like he doesn't care that like Ulysses S. Grant was like a total monster and a drunk like he's good at winning battles and you shouldn't expect that everybody you work with is this well-rounded person who's good at everything and I just like I think that's a really fundamental point that is very easy to overlook especially when you're coming right out of education because the the whole school system has taught you the opposite and in the real world double down on what you're good at and don't spend a lot of time on what you're bad at if it doesn't really affect you but you like the time tracking part did you mike yeah i mean i did like that strengths part because it, it was very it's very useful right like the idea of if you're in a good organization, you can hopefully find it. But like, especially, especially if you're working on anything for yourself, creatively or otherwise, like understanding what you're good at, doing that, and then trying to work with other people who can help complement the skills that you're not so good at is an incredibly valuable thing to learn. Mm. But I would say, I really would say, it, I agree with Gray, read that part, but I really think reading the beginning and I think the whole chapter on time tracking is very useful. Mm. Um, I think that it does in some places a better job of explaining why than we have been able to explain over the course of the show. There are sometimes things that are interesting when you read books like this is that it can help communicate an idea that you already know, but like it can solidify it for you. Mm -hmm. And there are like a bunch of just like really excellent quotes about why time tracking is important. And again, it's like to think that, you know, whilst this book is it's long winded and it can be a bit frustrating in places, Drucker really knew what he was talking about. Like he was coming up with a bunch of this stuff in 69, right? Like he, mm -hmm. he kind of, he really got it, right? Like he, there was some stuff that he totally understood and he made it, you know, he kind of made it work all the way back then, right? Like things that we're still doing today. So there's a couple of things that I like, right? He says the executive's time tends to belong to everybody else. <laughs> I can I can see why you you in particular, Mike. Yeah, I can see why you would like that quote. And I love it, right? Like th there is, and then, like it kind of leads on. Like the fundamental problem is the reality around the executive. Unless he changes it by deliberate action, the flow of events will determine that he is concerned with and what he does. So, like, I find this stuff to be very true for people that are self-employed or people that, you know, maybe head up a small team or, or anything. Like, your time is a lot of the time in, it pulled in such, in so many different ways that you actually don't get to control it because mm -hmm. people require things from you and mm -hmm. they require your time. So, you don't really get to control it. They control it. And 
it, funnily enough, I like it talks a lot about the fact that meetings are mostly just time wasting. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I like that again, 1969, but yet yeah, still happens more and more and more. Um, and, you know, he goes on by saying that what you want to do is find out where your time goes and then try to cut back on unproductive demands over time. And Drucker focuses on something that we talk about all the time is like, don't do it from memory. You have to actually yeah. record it. You have to record it because if you try and do it from memory, I love this. If we rely on our memory, we do not know how time has been spent. The important thing is that it gets done and that the record is made in real time. That is at the time of the event itself rather than later on from memory. And he says, like he goes on to say that like, if you do it from your memory, you record what you think you should have been doing rather than what you actually were doing. And I was like, that is such a good point because you're like, I know I had these important things to do today. I know I took care of them. That must have taken up the majority of my day. Well, that's probably mm. not true, but your brain weights these things because on what it thinks is important as opposed to where you actually put your time. Mm. No, it, it really is an excellent point. And, and we've, we've mentioned this on the previous book club episodes, but this, this phenomenon I think of as crystallization. That yep. You you bring to a book the solution of thoughts that's in your head. And then you read someone express an idea and your thoughts can crystallize around that idea. But you get out of books what you bring to them. And it's why when you're reading something, lots of sentences don't resonate at all. And then you feel like, oh, this sentence has crystallized what I've been, like you said before, like stuff that's been rolling around in your head. And like I was thinking as you're talking, I, I think I was a little bit harsh on this book by saying it's it's not a good book because the note that I made to myself is like, I think it, it's not a good book for me because I highlighted a bunch of stuff. And when I was rereading it, I highlighted even more, but I was very aware of I'm just going through this and highlighting things that I agree with and thoughts that I've already had for a really long time. But there was no point in reading the book where I felt like something crystallized for me. But it's because I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time and reading these. And and now, as you have revealed, like this is also a foundational book that has appeared in many others. But I'm, I'm reasonably confident that if I handed this book to the me who just graduated from college, he would actually get a lot out of it. That it would help sharpen and crystallize a bunch of his thoughts Mm -hmm. on these topics sooner than it would otherwise have happened. And so, yeah, I guess like maybe the more familiar you are with this stuff, the less good this book is. And the less familiar you are with it, the more potential it, it has for you to say like, oh, that's a great way to put this. Because yeah, like as you as you pointed out at the beginning, it also predates a lot of the business book tropes. So it does like I have to give this book credit for having a very high density of ideas. It, like there is not a lot of filler in this book. It's him much more talking about like time tracking, doing the best, managing your time, meetings are a waste of, waste of time. The, the concept of being an, an executive as one who is the executor of their own life and mm-hmm. trying to make things happen in some way. So, so yeah, I, like, I want to withdraw my comment about it being bad and, and simply phrase, like, it wasn't a book that had things for me to crystallize around, but it may very well have lots of those things depending on who the reader is. I think we should move on from it. Like, I feel like we've, we've drained most of what, we found interesting about this book, but I want to read like my final last quote just to to drive home the point about time tracking and why people should do it. So Draka says, time is the scarcest resource and unless it is managed, nothing else can be managed. The analysis of one's time, moreover, is the one easily accessible and yet systematic way to analyze one's work and to think through what really matters in it. I love that. It's just like, You only have your time. Your time is all you have to spend to do the work that you want to do. If you're not controlling your time, if you're not trying to look at your time in a clever way or in a smart way, 
or with any kind of like thought into where it's going, you won't be enabling yourself to be able to get done what you want to get done because your time is like leaking away in just, I don't know, being on phone calls or whatever. So I just thought it was a very good way of, of continuing to like drive home this point of time tracking being important. So I liked it a lot for that. The book itself was really rough in places, but rough for different <laughs> we- reasons to the usual books that we read. And I honestly think a lot of it is purely in the book's age. And I think that whilst it makes it kind of fascinating in places that the guy was talking about this stuff, it also like the the age of this book really kind of lets it down in certain places. So I think that's, that's the main problem that I had with it. Yeah. So as I close this book virtually, uh, don't don't let it tap to blue mana and cast forget on me again. If I ever like suggest that we do the effective executive at some point in the future, like if I if I suggest it again, you have to remember, Mike, that we've that we've already that we've already read it. Well, I will remember because there was something quite unique about this book. The effective executive is the first book I have actually read in probably like 10 years. You mean you mean like red red? Red with my eyes, not with my ears. Red with your eyes. <laughs> and how did you read it with your eyes, Mike? On a Kindle. Today's episode is brought to you by Hover. Building your online identity has never been more important than it is today. And with Hover, you can find the domain name that shows everyone what you're most passionate about. Like the fact that I am passionate about CortexMerch.com, I got the domain on Hover. I wanted to go and get a domain that was easy to register, that wasn't going to make me click through a thousand screens, right? When I want to get a domain name, Hover's where I go to. It's the place that helps you tell the story that you're looking to tell about your website. Hover has over 400 domain extensions that you can choose from to help you brand the site that you want the way you want. But it's more than just getting a website. Maybe you want a great email address. This is what domain names can also give you. There are tons of choices to help you find find the perfect domain name. And it's not all about .com or .net anymore. Sometimes there are domain extensions that can perfectly tell the story of what you want to show the world. Like for example, if you're a designer or another type of creative person, you can use the .design domain. And what's awesome about that is not only are you showing everyone exactly what you do because it says .design, but there's also going to be way more options available to you than there is with .coms. Like lots of regular words, lots of names, they're still going to be available with .design at the end. So this is a great thing to look at and it's a great thing to check out and you're in safe hands as well hover offer best-in-class customer support they are there for you when you need it stand out and build your online identity with the perfect domain name for you or your business new customers can get 10 percent off any of the over 400 domain extensions offered by going to hover.com slash cortex that's hover.com slash cortex to get 10 percent off your first purchase our thanks to hover for their support of this show and all of relay fm how was this experience? It was good and bad. There, There is good and bad to it, to the okay. point that I'm not really sure what I should do about these books going forward. Okay, so we, like, I just want to back up for a second for the listeners. Yeah. So Mike doesn't, doesn't read books with his eyes. Mike no. reads books with his ears. And can, can you give a, a summary about why that is the case, why you read books with your ears and not with your eyes? Like, how would you describe the reason for that? Um, I think that, like, see, I feel like I don't even want to talk to you about this, but I think it's, like, my attention. I I just don't really, and this has kind of been a thing always for me. I I struggle to focus on just sitting and reading. Um, Mm -hmm. Like, I get distracted really easily. Like, something that I noted about this book is, I had to be in an environment of complete silence to be able to read it, which was difficult. Uh, Hmm. Like, I can't listen to music. I was going to say not even music. Can't listen to music. Um, Like, I I just find myself getting distracted by noises and things moving. And, like, it, 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 it was difficult. And this isn't, like, a problem that I have with visual distractions when I'm listening to a book. Mm -hmm. Um, And plus, like, when I'm listening to a book, if I zone out a little bit, 
I don't notice it as much than like if mm. I'm sitting and reading and be like, I don't know what I just read. <laughs> I also I think that I am one of these. Well, I know I I'm one of these people that um I read each word in my head, right? Mm-hmm. So when I read the book, my brain is saying the words to me. Right. So I'm not a fast reader. So it it takes yeah. me quite a while to 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 actually read. Uh, yeah. So I do I do the same thing for the record, and yeah. it is mind blowing to me that people can read without doing that. Yep. I don't understand it. Like, and I've done some of that speed reading stuff. Like, I've tried it, and like I can do it. You know, like with a speed reading app where you just like just look at it and it goes into your brain. But I, it, that just, I don't like it. I, it. It feels like it makes my head hurt to, to, to do it. So uh, I've done those things, and it just makes the internal narrator faster, like, where it flashes the one word at a time. Like I'm still, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally still hearing it when they do that. It's, yeah. it's, very, yeah, it's very strange. <laughs> so you know that. So I just, I kind of just haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about it. I, audiobooks work for me. You know, mm-hmm. audiobooks work for me when I'm doing other things. You know, that was like something I was really noted about. Like, I couldn't read this book whilst walking. You know, like I couldn't mm-hmm. read this book whilst I was doing the washing up. Right. Like, I couldn't steal time away to read this book like I could with other books in the Cortex book. Club. Right. Right. Th- this book demands your full attention. <laughs> I need to sit down with the Kindle and spend this time just reading this book. Yeah, you can't also be playing Stardew Valley while you're listening to the book. Exactly. And, feel it, and, and right? feeling, oh, look at me. I'm being doubly productive. I'm relaxing and working at and the same farming. time. <laughs> so that, that was a frustration for me, and it made this book in places harder to get through. But mm-hmm. there are things that I was able to do with this book that I can't do with the audio book, and that is skimming. Mm-hmm. So when he's rattling on about the Bell Labs guy... I'm just like I'm just like skimming through it because as is usual with these books there is a thing that you'll note right if you read the first two paragraphs of a section and the last two paragraphs of a section as long as you understood the first two you'll understand mm-hmm. the last two mm-hmm. because they make their point they have a huge example and then they they conclude the point a lot of the time not always, but a lot of the time I don't need to have it explained to me in depth because I got what he was trying to say. There were times right. when I did need more and I would read it. But if he set up a, a thing, like, oh, I understand this. Like, I don't need a historical example like because I, mm. I get what you're talking about. So that's good because when I'm listening to the books, I have to listen to those things. But it did make me think, right? Is some of the best stuff about the Cortex Book Club the frustration? <laughs> Because if that makes this segment more interesting to listen to, then maybe I should be forcing myself to have to listen to it. Now, this now, book uh, uh, doesn't have a lot of that, right? So right. maybe it's not the best test case, but it was something I was aware of. Because like, I would not have continued to read like the examples of the... Uh, what what book? The uh, E-Myth. Was it the E-Myth guy who was like living on an island of his family on a moped? Yeah, was that was that even guy? visited. Yeah, right, I wouldn't have read that, right? I'd be like, I hate this, go away, and just like skipped over it. So I don't know, like maybe I would have had some really hilarious anecdotes of what it was like for the guy talking about reading a computer in 1969, but I couldn't bring myself to spend the time to read it. Mm-hmm. So that is like a good thing maybe for me, but I don't know if it's a good thing for when we are talking about those books. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, how much is it? the value people get from listening to us talk about the books versus how much people think it's hilarious to hear people suffer and other human suffering is hilarious. Uh, Like, so I I understand that and I don't understand how, you know, I, I read these books and to me, the thought of listening to them without the ability to skim is intolerable. (laughs) I just don't know how you could possibly, how you could possibly, do it so it's like to to me you have finally experienced the way that is the only way a human can survive these books which is to skim and to skim a lot when you feel like ah okay author i see what you're doing like you're going into your story let me just boop 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 down three paragraphs and now okay we're back we're back to talking about the actual the actual thing so like that that was a big that that was a big help for me when getting through this book but like 
I am undecided right now. Like, what is the best route forward? Right. Like, I feel like I would want to do it when whenever our next one is. I would want to try and read it again and like see see what I think is the best thing to ultimately do. So, so you would you would give you would give then reading a, a like a physical in quotes like a physical book a, a shot again. Like, well, look, it, here's the thing, right? Mm-hmm. So, the read time on the Kindle version was three and a half hours, is what it quoted me, right? Okay. The audiobook is 10 hours. Oh. Oh, God. I didn't read the whole book. Uh huh. But it probably took me about three hours, right? Because I'm not a fast enough reader, I don't think. But so it took me a third of the time to, to get this book done. Right. But there was no Stardew Valley time overlaid on those. Three so this hours. is what I haven't decided, right? Like now <laughs> I was able to skip a lot of the stuff I didn't want to read. And that was great. But I don't, I haven't worked out like the trade-offs for me yet as you know i i liked the system of highlighting and noting because mm-hmm. i didn't have to write out a separate note like i usually do mm-hmm. right and that was that the system on the kindle was very good for that and then i could just bring them all up on uh, a computer and then just like copy and paste into our show notes the bits that i wanted it let me triage it, it was it worked pretty well for that um i liked that the reading on the kindle was 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 fine i <sighs> I got the the Oasis, maybe. Was it the one with the battery pack in the cover, it or is it the? I didn't get the cover, but it, I can okay. have a cover, right? Like, but it's that got that weird hump on it. Right? It has three little pins on the back of it yeah. to connect to the battery cover. Okay, yeah, yeah I know it that has one. the weird hump, and it's like a square, right? Which mm-hmm. is it's all very strange, and it wasn't as comfortable as I wanted. So I got that one because it had a light on it. Like it had a backlight, mm-hmm. and I, I wanted a backlight. Um, but, like, whilst it's super small and super light, it's still not light enough. Like, <laughs> I feel like I wanted it to be a little bit lighter so I could mm. really easily and comfortably just, like, hold it in one hand. There's this weird thing that, like, whilst a paperback book is heavier, its thickness makes it, like, easier to hold. Like, there's, like, a balance to it. Where this thing is so thin... But yet it's not light enough, and the weight is misbalanced because of the strange hump. I just had a genius idea, which okay. I did, and it hadn't even crossed my mind until just now. Because I do love the Kindles, and uh, but they are their thinness does make them hard to hold sometimes, and I'm I'm aware of that. And the the newest Kindle is heavier than the version that you used. They made it bigger, and it's heavier. But I just realized, Mike, pop socket. On the Kindle. Oh, now I I never that thought of this. Is genius. But this seems great. Like, why That's not? Perfect. This, this, yeah. That's perfect. Is, I'm gonna get. Oh, I'm gonna damn. grab my Kindle right now. And, like, I have put an a extra pop socket, pop socket right on the I'm back of stick it. it. Straight on there. That is genius. <laughs> genius. Oh, by the way, pop sockets. They've introduced a new version mm-hmm. where you can like easily twist the part off the back. Right. It, they've they've called it like pop tops so you can one thing you can do is customize it but the other it lets you do wireless charging yeah no someone someone sent me that and it's still i still it doesn't work the way i would want it but like it's it made me angry because what i want is no steps and that's one step i might as well plug in the wire at that point right i I I totally agree with you i totally agree with you but on the off chance that it was like that that made sense i thought i'd recommend it right like i I appreciate that they have created they have tried i think they've tried to do their best right like to to how can we make this work but it's still like i wouldn't want to be like taking these discs on and off every day yeah, but, it is but so that's 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 what I'm gonna do. Pop socket on the back of my Kindle immediately. I think that's that's good. gonna be great. So yeah, I would say that like overall, I think there are benefits to this which I knew existed, but didn't really know how beneficial they would be in like mm-hmm. being able to skip stuff without like enraging every time I'm listening to these like horrific lists. But mm-hmm. also though, like Drucker isn't that bad with this stuff, so. I want to give it a go with some of another book before I make my final decision as to yeah. whether, like, going forward, I will use a Kindle or ever use an audiobook, right? Like, he is not, he was not one of these people that would write, like, 17 different things, you know? We were mm-hmm. like, 
I have helped like people who have been gambling. I have helped people who right, like you know right. like going on and on and on and on and on where you could just easily jump it. Like there wasn't that much of it. His stuff that I was skipping were just really long stories that I didn't care about, um, mm-hmm. or a computer chapter in 1969. <laughs> I feel right. like I should go back and read that at some point, but like, but so yeah, the, I would say the Kindle experiment was an interesting one. Um, I just haven't made my mind up yet to what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do going forward. Yeah, well, but like, I, I will say it was better than I thought. I thought I was gonna absolutely hate it and wouldn't finish the book and would have to go to the audiobook, and that wasn't the case. Well, that, that's what I was wondering was going to happen because when you suggested the idea that you were going to try to read this one on Kindle, which I can't even really remember why you originally... Was it because you were traveling a bunch and you thought maybe you'll use the I Kindle? I have no then? idea, idea how it came up. Like one of us just <laughs> mentioned it and then it'd be like, oh, that'd be interesting to talk about. So I just did it. I, I, have, I have no memory like of why we ended up deciding to do this, but we right, just okay. did. Yeah, but like I was, I was interested in you doing this because of the way that you entirely read books by listening to them instead of looking at them with your eyes. And I, I don't know, I was just kind of curious about what your experience was of reading a book with your eyes, but I'm also just realizing, but of course, the only books you're ever going to be reading are are these horrible books for the Cortex book club. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, not a, it's not exactly... Like you're not exactly snuggling up on a couch with Harry Potter, right? It's like it's not quite the same experience. I did read a fiction audiobook recently, but like it, I don't know if it really fits the bill. I read The Handmaid's Tale. But but okay, but you listened to it or you read it? I listened to it. I listened okay. to it. But that was also an interesting thing because that was like the first fiction that I'd read in any form in like 10 years <laughs> as well. So yeah, I guess like I want to I want to say this without any judgment just to be clear because i think there's this weird societal judgment about like oh people who read books are better than people who yep. don't right which i think is dumb and so I'm, I'm not trying to do that but i was i was kind of curious if your experience with the kindle gave you even the slightest feeling of like oh maybe i would want to sit on a couch and and read a book with my eyes instead of instead of listening to one like did that did that happen at all all like is it a thing that you might imagine in your life with a kindle or or do you think like it's just it's just not a thing that you're ever going to do i don't think that this experience made me any more likely to do it Mm, okay all right that make i I think that makes sense like that that makes sense given your reasons from earlier but i was was just kind of curious if i wanted you to do it because i thought maybe there's like a teeny tiny chance that you might end up finding that you really enjoy the experience of the mm-hmm. Kindle, but I just hadn't really thought about the fact that I was making you read something torturous and like, maybe that's not the best introduction. <laughs> yeah. I just, I can't explain why I am this way, but I just don't enjoy reading. And again, I'm, I'm not being judgmental about that. I just think it's, it just, I find it. I just find that interesting. It is. And I, I don't know the reason why. Like, it's not like I don't have problems with the content. Like, it's not like I never want yeah. to read X, Y, or Z. Like, I I've, I like to listen to things, right? But, I mean, I, I'm the same. It's not just books. Like, it's I don't like to read 2,000 long New York Times articles. Like, it's just not, you know, it's just not my thing. Yeah, I guess the reason I find it interesting is because you are a curious person. Like you're interested in things in the world. You're interested in thinking about things. And with people that I know, that correlates very highly with reading. And people who are generally incurious people, it correlates very low with reading. So I guess that's why I always just find this, my mind wanders back to this on occasion. Because you are uh, like a bit of a statistical outlier with people in my social circle with regards to this behavior. So, uh, but I'm, I'm glad you gave it a shot on the Kindle. I guess I'm going to try to pick a much like I'm going to try to pick a real winner for like I need a really engaging book for the next Cortex book club that we can still pass off as uh, like a workbook for. Oh, the show. right. You're trying to win me over. 
I get it. See, I was just thinking, no. like, we no, just no, pick no, no, something, no, 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 like, no, no, no. horrifically bad, so I'll understand if I like skipping sections still. No, but... no, I'm not, I'm not trying, I'm not trying to win you over. I just think if you're going to give, if you're going to give the Kindle one more shot, I would like something that has at least the chance of being somewhat engaging. I think that's, mm. that's what I would be aiming for on the next Cortex Book Club. We'll see. Who knows? I'm trying to think, like. Have we read any book so far? The Creativity Inc. I think was was good. Yeah, but that wasn't even a business book though. Really, it was like his biography, and I like biographies. Yeah, and but but like, look, that's close enough, right? Like Maybe that's within that's within one the like greater that. orbit. Yeah, it's within the greater orbit of Cortex Book Club. We can we can try to find something, or uh, I guess the listeners can suggest things and. Maybe several months from now, I can go back and try to find something. I don't know. We'll we'll figure it out. 